Thanks, Nicole. Hey, Zoomies. Again, Maja Gary here, Internal Communications Manager um, at Zoom, and super excited that you chose to join us for HBCU Week. I am so excited to be chatting with Terrence J., who is a uh, fellow Aggie here. Terrence, hi. How you feeling? What's up? Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. We are so excited for you to be here. So we're excited about the conversation. We are going to go ahead and jump right in. So Terrence, tell well, us. Well, hold on, before we get into that, okay, I see Nicole's, I need, Nicole, I need a phenomenally black t-shirt and I need your letterman jacket. Let me see that letterman jacket. Ooh, you ain't playing around. Neither one of y'all are playing around on these Zoom calls. Man, thank you. Okay, now we can proceed. I'm sorry. Okay, to now we can proceed. <laughs> y'all are killing it. Now we can proceed. Thank you so much. Okay, so Terrence, tell us a little bit about your journey to choosing a &T. Originally from Queens, yep. you went all the way down to Greensboro, North Carolina to go to a &T. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, so it, the, the story, it really starts with my mother, um, who is a phenomenal uh, Black woman who had me... She got, she got pregnant when she was young. She was 16 years old. She had me when she was 17. Um, and she didn't get to go to college because she had me. Uh, so I was born in Queens, New York. She, we had family um, that lived in North Carolina. So we moved down to North Carolina when I was like 10, 11 years old. But it was always her goal for me to go to college. She was always like, look, I need you to go represent for me since I didn't get to have that opportunity because of you. And so, and she later went back to school, but it was very important for me to go for her. So I went and I applied to as many colleges as I could, uh, NC State, Carolina, Duke. And I, I, quite frankly, I didn't have the grades or the money to go to any of those institutions. And North Carolina and NC State University, they took a chance on me. Uh, I was on academic probation almost my entire freshman year. Um, and from going from academic probation that first year uh, to my year when I graduated, I graduated with honors uh, with a 3.8 GPA, uh, student body president, member of a fraternity. It was that time in college that completely changed my life. I met the right professors. I met the right friends. I met the right mentors. I met the right girl. I met, I met all of the right people that came in and nurtured me with the love that I needed to get out of my own way and go after my dreams. And so when I tell people about why HBCUs are so important to me, uh, it, it's, it's not just what we learn in the classroom. It's that nurturing. It's that love. It's that camaraderie. Um, all of those uh, um crest and logos that I see behind you, even if I didn't go to Shaw, even if I didn't go to Howard, um, we're all part of one HBCU family. And, and that's what I love so much about going to an HBCU. And I'm so happy uh, that I attended one. Yes, the best is, is the one that you attended. Yeah. Um, and can I also just mention that uh, Terrence majored in journalism and mass communication, which I also majored in journalism and mass communication. So we're pretty much related. Um, Terrence, tell, tell us, um, was it a culture shock for you coming from Queens and then going to an HBCU yeah. in North Carolina? I, I remember, you know, I was, I was a, about 10, 11 years old, I think, when we officially moved down. And yeah, going from a big city uh, like Queens um, to a, a very, very small town in, in North Carolina, not even Rocky Mount. It was on the outskirts of Rocky Mount. Um, it was a huge culture shock, even at a young age. But there was so much, you know, this was the 80s and 90s. There was so much crime happening in, in, in New York at the time. Uh, this is before they really cleaned up the city. So there was just all types of, you know, drugs and gangs that, was, that were in my neighborhood. And so my mom made that decision to get me out of there, right? She didn't want me to have to, you know, look over my back when I was walking home from school and, and growing up in, in Queens at the time. All the, all the stuff that 50 Cent raps about, you know, imagine 50 Cent in your school and I'm me, right? I don't want to, I'm running home, right? So she, she wanted to get me out of there. But at the same time, we moved down, we moved down next to a cotton field. I kid you not, literally outside of my window in, in, in North Carolina was a cotton field. And so it was a, a huge um, uh, transition. Uh, I knew that 
I was different and I knew that I, I wanted to express myself and, and I knew that, you know, I, I had artistry in my, in my blood, but at the time it was like either you're Oprah or you're Will Smith or you're Michael Jordan. And there was really no in-betweens, you know, and there weren't a lot of multi-hyphenate. There weren't a lot of people that kind of juggled a bunch of things. And so it was incredibly, you know, it was, it was definitely a transition and it was really hard to understand what I wanted to do uh, at that, that, that point in my life. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Now you talked about being student body president, right? Talked about being a member of a fraternity. What else did you do while on campus? Um, uh, I needed to do more. That was that was all I had time for. <laughs> now I um so so my my first year, uh, like I said, I I just loved partying so much um, that I just spent so much time, you know, going to parties. Uh, but little did I know that I was planting the seeds for what would be my future career, right? I was passing out flyers, which taught me, you know, grassroots marketing. I was on the mic, which is, you know, the stepping stone for all of the things that I did after that. You know, we, me and, and my manager, Fred, who you met and some of our friends, I mean, we created our own little entertainment company and we, you know, we're entrepreneurial in the sense of, you know, doing our own parties and hosting a DJ and, and doing the whole thing. So even though I didn't know it at the time, and even though my grades were suffering, I was, I was, I was getting that, you know, uh, that work um, uh, experience. And then once I learned balance, um, and once I learned how to, you know, compartmentalize and how to, how to focus on things and, and, and how to surround myself with people that could help me out, um, that's how I was able to get my grades where they needed to be. And that's how I was able to join a fraternity. Um, and I had a work study. I, I, I worked, uh, I did an externship at NASCAR um, my, my sophomore year. Uh, and then I went back every summer. And that I, I was in their diversity department. Um, for, for NASCAR, obviously, uh, a lot of things didn't work, but, uh, I, I worked in their diversity department and it, it taught me, they taught me how to write. Like I, I really learned how to write letters cause I, I did a lot of outreach. Um, I learned how to work within a corporate structure. I learned how to be around people that didn't look like me. And I, and I had a great experience. It was a great time there as well. Um, and again, I say all of these different things, right, from being, you know, doing nightclub work at 2 a.m. in the morning to working at on campus and commercial radio stations to working at a, at a you know, huge uh, sport corporate entity like NASCAR. All of the collection of, of different things helped shape me. And um, they were very instrumental um, in, in what I was able to do afterwards. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Now, you know, a lot of folks who attend and graduate from HBCUs, right, you talked about this, it being a family, right, this is our safety net, this is where we feel at home. Um, and this is where we're surrounded by people who look like us, who think like us, who have goals like us. Once you graduated, right, and launched your career, was it a culture shock for you in the industry that you went into, in the entertainment industry? Um, so my first job out was at NASCAR. I worked down at Daytona Beach. Um, and again, incredible learning experience, but uh, my heart and soul, you know, wanted to do other things. And, you know, I remember, you know, having to take the leap to audition in New York City and, and audition in LA for a bunch of different things. And at that time, you know, you, you I auditioned for a hundred things and got told no 99 times, but it was the one time I got told yes, that changed my life. And my, you know, my first big job in entertainment was at BET. And, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't a culture shock, um, but it, it was it was a shock in every other way. You know, my first one of my first interviews was Janet Jackson, you know, and so I went from doing on campus interviews to now I'm interviewing an icon. Right. And also dealing with the fact that there were hugely popular people that were in my job prior to me getting there. And, you know, people didn't like us and hated us. And, you know, they wanted those other people back. And, and so I had to deal with a, a lot of that. Um, so, you know, the early lessons were, uh, you know, not taking no for an answer, right? 
You get told no 99 times, it could be that 100th time that takes your life. Uh, when you get into a position, whether you're working with white people, black people, any type of people, any type of level of diversity or, or, or no, whatever it is, um, there are going to be people that hate you for whatever you do, right? There are going to be people that are going to try to stop you from whatever you do. There are going to be people on, on every level of it that are going to, you know, they're going to take their uh, uh, experiences and anything that they haven't been able to accomplish in their life, and they're going to project that onto you. And if you let any of that deter you from your dreams, if you let anybody else's energy, anybody else's anything stop you um, from going after what you're passionate about, uh, you won't be able to accomplish uh, true greatness. And so those are all lessons that I learned um, early on. Yeah, that was good. That was really good. Um, now, you know, I love how you kind of spoke to, you know, how you created your own experiences, you know, Auntie, that sort of propelled your career. But, you know, there is a stigma that HBCUs don't prepare students for the real world, right? Because, you know, when we get out there, there's not a lot of people who look like us. What do you say to that? Well, you know, well, for anybody that went to an HBCU uh, when I went, then, you know, right now, it's the, it's the most valuable thing, Right. Having that experience from HBCU for me now has been the best decision I've ever made. I, everything you said is absolutely true. Uh, at the time that I went to an HBCU, people looked at it as if it was some second tier or secondary type of you know, school uh, and education, as if you know, our professors or our university or anything wasn't up to par. But now looking back, I, I am the luckiest person in the world that I went uh, from people that I work with that, you know, from the, the producers like Will Packer. I've done movies with Taraji P. Henson. I work a lot with the Puff, all of which went to an HBCU. So there's always a level of connection. But now working in the corporate marketplace, every Fortune 500 company wants to tap into the HBCU market. Every, you know, you know, at, after the pandemic, after everything with Black Lives Matter, it's on everybody's corporate mandate. So it's 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 such a you know notch under your belt if you went. Um, so I'm so proud that I went. And anybody that's watching that's considering going uh, now, you don't even have to look at it as if it's like now. You know, every time I I'm, I'm here in Houston right now, and I just left the the campus of TSU uh, Texas Southern University, state of the art. Beautiful campus, you know, the, the endowments are getting better and better. Uh, the, the professors are, of course, incredible. And, you know, the, the education is second to none. So I definitely, for anybody considering it, please, you know, you do yourself a favor uh, and, and come join us uh, in the HBCU fabric. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And I love how you mentioned, you know, these these profound people who are bringing, you know, more attention to HBCUs, right? We see Diddy and Taraji donating, giving back, shouting, shouting us out, you know, during the BET Awards, um, Deion Sanders, who's now a coach at Jackson State. Um, and so I, I feel that HBCUs have, you know, moved more into the spotlight. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? And how can we keep that momentum going? Oh, I think I think it's 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 something that's long overdue. You know, I think it's you know everything has its time, and you know our our university has been around you know a hundred year you know of, of great work and great service. So for me, I'm just happy that it's you know it's every time I see Chris Paul walk onto the the court wearing you know Winston Salem State University or you know Grambling, it's. It's, it's exciting to see that national attention that HBCUs are getting. Um, and I just hope it continues. I, I hope that companies continue um, to, you know, if you weren't in before, that's okay. Come join us now. Come support now. Come uh, hire and get interns from our, 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 our schools now. Come visit us on campus now. Come see some of the great things that we're doing now. Um, and, you know, it's, it's never too late to join the party. And I'm just so happy that it's, it's getting that detention that attention uh, that it deserves. Yeah, yeah. Now, Tanj, you personally, what are you doing to sort of give back, support, um, and promote HBCUs? Uh, currently, I'm the uh, national ambassador for the Thurgood Marshall College. Uh, and so that's a huge um, job for me. I try to, I'm just, I'm just at a place in my life, I just 
had my 40th birthday. And for me, um, my, my mandate to myself is for everything that I do work-wise to forward my career, I also try to do an equal amount of hours and time and giving back. I, you know, right now I'm, I, I spent the day uh, talking to students about the digital divide. Um, and how, you know, infrastructure on campuses and infrastructure in our black and brown communities are disproportionate, right? We need, you know, better Wi-Fi, more equipment, more, all of these things, right? Um, we need to make sure that our, our young people are getting trained in, in how to use Zoom, right? Using, I mean, if you right now, if you don't use Zoom or don't know how to use it, you are at a huge disadvantage. I can't even imagine what life would be, right? And so I'm, you know, just spending hours and making sure that, that I'm uh, touching the students. We give out scholarships. I do internships. I work with a, a bunch of corporations. And, and, you know, I spend a lot of time doing, uh, you know, uh, uh, fireside chats like this and, and just, you know, preaching the gospel of, of what HBCUs are and what we represent. Um, because, we, you know, we've done some incredible work, but we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, that's so true. Now, how do we lean on leaders and influencers and catalysts and activists um, to help us promote HBCUs? How do we push them? How do we get in contact? What, what do we need to do uh, from this level to, con to continue to push that? Well, look, to answer your question, I mean, we, we have to support our leaders, right? We want to make sure that you know, all of the, the, the Stacey Abrams and all of the Tyler Perry's and all of the Oprah's and all of the, the, the leadership in, in our black and brown communities. We wanna make sure that we, you know, we, we get the word and we keep on pushing them. But the, 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 the bigger work I will say is, is done by you, what you are doing. Uh, and you know what, what Nicole is doing and what your department's doing. When I see Zoom Soul, right? That's where the, the, the real daily work is getting done, right? When you are, are walking into your nine o'clock meeting and you have that HBCU background and you have your, you walk in there with your, I already know how you walk in. You're prepared. Your head is high. You have your, you know what I mean? And, and we're, we're showing that we can be in any room where, you know, that's where the work is done. Right when we wear our natural hair into the work workplace, that's where the work is done. When we break down barriers, that's where the work is done. When you're in there fighting for the budget for this, right? That's when the work is done. Right? I'm not able to speak at a at an organization like Zoom or any of the other corporations I do unless there's somebody that looks like you that knows who I am that is in that room saying, "No, we need to get this guy." Right? <laughs> and here's why. And he needs to talk to our diverse departments and we need to have these conversations and here's why, right? And so the bigger thing that I, you know, that, that I'm always talking is, you know, when, when me and Chairman Hart or me and whoever, it's like, how can we further support you guys? Because you guys are on the front lines doing the, 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 the necessary work because, you know, the, the uh, America, you know, it, it's run by, by companies, it's run by corporations. The trickle effect down to our communities, the trickle effect from the, the disproportionate uh, resources and finance, it all comes from, you know, the big companies, right? And so making sure that we have the right people in there, making sure that we have the right representation in there, uh, and all of that is, is, is important to the fabric of getting things done. And, um, and then the other piece that I'll say is just, you know, working with our young people, right? All of our, our young people, um, you know, we didn't get a lot of the, the legacy information and the years and years of, of, of handed down houses, handed down job opportunities, handed down information in our communities. And so it's just so important that we all, you know, spend as much time as we can with our elementary students, our middle school students, give them as much information and as much inspiration as they can, uh, because we have a lot of ground to cover, you know, and now that, you know, so many different spotlights are on us, we have to make sure we give them the tools and the confidence and the information um, so that they, they can continue to be successful. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Now, you know, we can we can always promote, you know, the HBCU agenda, we can always push that forward. And, and, you know, shout to the top of our lungs, why HBCU representation um, 
or, or why we need, I guess, representation from HBCUs. But in your own words, why is that important? Like, why is it important that that companies like Zoom and Microsoft and Google are tapping into HBCUs and bringing in more Black talent? Oh, it's, you know, this there, there's nothing more important for HBCUs than to have big companies donate resources, donate money, financial support, and, and create the pipelines uh, for our, our students to get training, to get internships and externships, to, to get mentorships, and to you know, eventually get jobs, right? The, the, the pipeline is, is, is necessary. And so the more we have you know, companies like Zoom on campuses like TSU, the, the more the students there are gonna have that, the, the necessary tools that they need for success. And that's what it boils down to. You know, when I was going to job fairs, you know, 20 years ago, there was a, a limited, you know, handful of companies that even knew what it was, right? And so now, now that we have the national spotlight, now it's time that we, you know, kick those doors wide open, bring everybody to the party, get the, the, the further job opportunities. You know, we went to A&T. There are more nurses, more engineers coming out of, more black nurses and engineers and teachers coming out of A&T than, you know, any other predominantly white institution in the, in the country, right? So we have to make sure that those, those pipelines are open and, and that starts with the company stepping in uh, and having, you know, dialogues like this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the most, I, I believe, you know, valuable things that you gain from an HBCU is network, right? Is that network. How do you leverage your network from your HBCU now? You know, it's, it's twofold. Uh, Issa Rae um, gave an incredible analogy at a, uh, at a panel that I was at uh, a few years ago. And I always, um, I always preach it now. Um, she always said, uh, part of her business mantra was not just reaching up, it was reaching across, right? And I was kind of already doing it before I even knew what it meant. But, you know, so many times you think somebody can come down and save you, right? I gotta, you know, give my, my, my audition, give my tape, give my resume to somebody who's going to give me the opportunity from up above. When in actuality, um, really networking and really reaching across to the people that are on your level and building something is of the utmost importance. And that's, you know, especially us in the black and brown community, something that we, we have to continue to do more of, right? You know, my, you, you met him, Fred, my manager of 20 years was also my roommate in college, right? I didn't go to Hollywood and find, you know, some agent to come and, and leave the guy and the people that are there with you from the jump. You look at LeBron James, an incredible example of him empowering, you know, his, his three, uh, two or three uh, um, high school buddies now are his agents and one of the biggest agents in sports, um, his production company lead, his men, you know, so it's, it's about reaching across. And, and I think that that's something that we don't speak about enough. And, uh, and it's just something I always just try to remind us to reach across at those that are, that are with us on the journey. Yeah, yeah, that was really good. Terrence, give us three to the five most valuable things that you took from your HBCU. Three to five most valuable things that I took from an HBCU. All right, well, I'll start with the, you know, the, the, the first thing that I took, I spoke about earlier, is the fact that there's no road to success without having the right team and people in place. There's no successful person that's been able to accomplish things on a big scale that didn't have help and support, right? Even Jesus had his disciples. Everybody needs the team around you in order to get your, your goals. And so when I went into, to, you know, I bounced around and I moved around a lot. Uh, and so going to an HBCU gave me that foundation. They gave me that support system. That, that is where I have the people that have supported me, you know, since then in my entire life. Um, so the, the first lesson is, is don't try to, you can't go at life alone. You know, we, we are, mammals are social creatures. We need each other. And so surround yourself 
with people that have a common vision, a common goal, that want to see you succeed, that encourage you and don't discourage you from going after your dreams. Um, it takes a village. So the first thing uh, is, you know, surround yourself with the right people. Uh, the second thing I would say um, that I learned from going to an HBCU is to never give up. You know, you can start off with humble beginnings. I started off, you know, like I said, on academic probation, but where you start the race is not where you have to end the race. And so, you know, one thing I, I know is every time I go to an HBCU, everybody has a story. There's so many first generation college students. You know, you go to the, the campus of Harvard University, you go to an Ivy League institution, Yale, you might be, you might meet a student that is fourth generation, fifth generation, you know, the, the, that is, you know, their, their grandfather's grandfather was on the, the, the board, their, you know, their uncle is the dean, you know, they know a person who wrote the letter to get the, you know, they, 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 they live in a, a mansion. They have homes. When their parents die, they're going to have a house. They have equity, right? We don't have that a lot of times. We don't have life insurance a lot of times. When we die, we have bills to pay because of the death. Not we inherit a bunch of money and get our inheritance, right? This happens and this occurs from a systemic problem, hundreds and hundreds you know, of years, right? And so we're playing catch up. And so everybody that comes to, to an HBCU, especially, you know, we, we, all, we all have a story to tell. We all fought to get where we are. And so I just wanna make sure to just say again that, you know, what, what, whatever uh, step you on or your climb up the mountain is just to don't give, you know, don't give up. Keep on going. Keep on going after it. We're all in this together. We've all been through a lot. We all are, are here to support each other. And it's just important to remember that sometimes of like, you know, the it's gonna be hard. You know, the the the, the road is a is a is a long road, it's a tough road, but don't give up. And then last but not least, the the, the last thing I learned from, from going into an HBC, one of the last things I learned is is you know the the culture and the vibes. You know, when, you know, going to an HBCU teaches you how to, how to perform at the cookout properly, right? <laughs> but before I let go comes on, you know how to do your two-step in your electric slide. When, you know, when, when the swag serve hits, you know exactly which direction to wave in. You know, when, 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 when it's Soul Food Wednesday at the calf, you know where you got to be to get your fish sandwich. Or your, you know exactly what it is. And all of those things, and I know it's funny and I know it's, but now that I'm out in the workforce, now that I'm out of workplace, all of those things are so important. We as, 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 as Black people in this country, uh, you know, we have tradition, we have culture, we are able to learn, you know, it's not, it, you know, the rhythm and, and, and the vibes, and, and I know we laugh about it when we say, you know, the cookout, but for, for the, 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 the 300 years we've been here in America, right, these are the traditions that we've established, right? Our forefathers, our people that have, that have fought for our freedom, all of those, these things that we've inherited, the things that, you know, our fraternities and sororities and the stepping and all of these things from the, you know, from the 1900s, early 1900s to the 30s, to the 60s, to the 70s and the, all of those vibes are, are our culture, right? Unfortunately, a lot of us can't, we can't, you know, I don't, I don't know where I'm from in Africa. I don't, we don't, we, we, we that can't, got stripped from us, right? But we can now look to the future so that a hundred years from now, they our, our grandchildren understand the the vibes, right? And that's the that's the culture that the epicenter of that culture takes place now on an HBCU campus, right? We might we have our concerts, we have our rolling louds and our you know our 
one concerts. We go to Atlanta, we have a good time. We go to Essence Music Festival in New York. Like we have our times during the year, but the living, breathing heart of that on a daily basis of our culture, of our traditions, of our music, of our food, of our passed down traditions, all of that come, you know, that's happening every single day uh, at Hampton. That's happening every single day at FAMU. The, the, the women of Spelman are, you know, they're, they're, we're discussing these things every single day. We're talking on, on Morehouse and Clark Atlanta every day about us. And so that is why HBCUs um, are so important. Sorry for my long-winded answer, but <laughs> yeah, I hope y'all are taking notes from Pastor Terrence because uh, he just dropped some gems. Um, one, nobody is successful alone. Two, don't give up. And three, make sure y'all know the electric slide for the cookout. Um, uh, all culture, all vibes. Um, real quick, Terrence, and then we'll, we'll turn it over for some um, Q&A. You mentioned, you know, the culture, the vibes. Tell us about the homecoming experience. What is the significance of that? How do you feel? <laughs> How do you feel that homecoming? Tell us about that. We did an event the other day. We, we talked about homecoming a little bit, but tell us about that. I'll tell you from three different perspectives. So, uh, you know, the year is 1998. It's two years before it was time to go to college. And I had a friend that lived in Greensboro. Uh, and I, I was living in Raleigh at the time. And his parents went to a &T. And he went to a &T. You know, his, his parents invited us. We were high school kids. And I went to a, a homecoming for the first time. And I just remember being on a &T's campus, looking around, seeing the, the most gorgeous, beautiful Black women I've ever seen in my life. Uh, seeing the coolest guys, with the best haircuts and the coolest cars and the coolest jackets and clothing, just, you know, walking around. And I remember there was a, you know, a popular show called A Different World. And I was like, oh my God, this, this is that. And I remember seeing a fraternity, you know, brothers and the sorors and the, and the frat brothers, you know, setting it out. And I remember smelling the food and all of those things were like sensory overload for me, you know, as a, uh, you know, 16, 17 year old. And that experience, you know, changed my life. And, you know, then when you went to, when I went to school every year at homecoming was that time to, you know, kind of let loose we're representing our school, we're representing our team, we're, you know, we're talking to the other universities, people come in to visit, all the people come back, like it just, it was the best time when you're in school and it's homecoming. And, and now, you know, as an adult, um, somebody said he's smelling the food. Yeah, I was smelling the food. Uh, now as an adult, I, you know, on my yearly calendar, um, after, you know, I've, I've, I've been doing this now for, you know, over 20 years. Every year calendar is, is pretty similar, right? The beginning of the year starts off with award season. So, I, you know, I'll be, you know, you look at it, I've got the Grammys, the Oscars, the Golden Globes. You go into the, the spring, which is, you know, the Coachellas and, the, and, and you know, the, the spring season and all of those events. And then you got the, the summertime stuff and the Essence Music Festivals and all of that. But when, when, when September, October, November rolls around, there's nothing like knowing that homecoming season is coming back around. And it's that opportunity to go home. I get to see my mom when I go to, you know, so I always get to see my family. If I, I, I try to see her as many times during the year as I can, but I always want to see my, my actual family. I'm gonna see my frat brothers who we, we, we visit each other. You know, that this is the time where I get to hear about, how's your kids doing? How's your wife doing? You, you, you have a, a loved one that passed, I'm sorry. But you have all of these conversations, you do that catching up. And then you just, you you know, especially for everybody that works at a, at a, at a corporate job, a non it's that time to like, this is when out of the year, this is where you come be you. You done fought tooth and nail. In them Zoom meetings all year long, you in there fighting for the budget. 
fighting for the culture, getting the job done, doing this, doing that. But when you come down to homecoming, ain't no fighting. <laughs> you know, well, it could be some fight. It could be some fight. I don't keep it over. It could be that. Too. But it's gonna be a fun fight. You don't laugh about it when you leave. And it's that time to come back and let our hair down and be us unapologetically. And uh, and that's you know all of that spectrum is is what homecoming means to me. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. I felt it. Like I felt it. I smelt it. I felt it. Yes. Oh my God. I felt it. I smelt it. All right, Nicole, tossing it over to you. Do we have any questions just yet? Yes. First, just let me just say, Terrence, you are not 40. Okay. <laughs> you are 40. So stop with that. Stop with that. Again, black don't crack. I was like, that boy, no, he's 22 years old, but whatever. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so Terrence, first of all, you keep bringing up frat. So of course, everybody wants to know what fraternity are you a member of? Oh, Dog I'm making five. I'm making five. <laughs> okay, okay, all right, all right. Was that a disappointment, show? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I'm a daughter of Alpha Man. Hey, at least you tried. So oh, oh, no, I'm just kidding. I love Omega. I love Omega. You see the chat? Everybody's like, "Q, Q." <laughs> all right, so Terrence. Um, you've worked with a lot of people, a lot of really like incredible people, some incredible directors. Who is it that you'd still want to work with? You know what I mean? Like, like who is who is one or two people you're like, if I had an opportunity to work with them? You know, um, for me, directing is next. Uh, okay. I really, you know, directing is the next stage. I feel like, you know, I've been on, on in front of the camera you know, way too long and, and stepping behind the lens is like my next thing. Um, so I want to work with directors who I look up to, like like Jordan Peele, I think is incredible. Tyler Perry and what he's built is incredible. Um, you know, I love David E. Talbert who's, uh, and Tim Story. Just, you know, I love our, our black and brown directors. And I want to work with, you know, white directors and, you know, all background um, directors as, as well. Um, and actors, you know, I, I love film, I love storytelling. Um, and so that that's, you know, on the creative side, that's where I spend a, a, a lot of my time. Um, but a, a lot of my time is also just spent doing more business. Um, I'm just like in a business phase of my life, real estate, uh, you know, properties and real estate and, you know, investing in businesses and expanding the portfolio uh, is, is, is a lot of where my mind is right now. Okay. Um, what is your favorite? What is your favorite HBCU band? Oh, I mean the Blue and Gold Marching Machine, North Carolina <laughs> You know, but I mean, you know, the thing is, is like, you know, I just um, now I travel so much. I I I've, I've been to almost every, every HBCU on this list right there. I, yeah. well, I've been to, and I I've been to so many campuses so many times, man. It just it all kind of you know we are just so dope, you know. We are just dope. And, you know, from the smaller schools to the bigger ones, man, our, we just got so much heart and soul um, in, our, in our bands and in our football teams and basketball teams and our cheerleaders. Like, it's just, it's, I'm, I'm always amazed by how much love um, uh, and, and just how, how dope we are every time I, I yeah. go out. So some folks would say you've made it. Do you feel like you've made it or what more is left? And, and what exactly does that mean to you as far as like you've made it? You know, I, I think um, I'm a, you, I always try to look at things from, from both spectrums. I'm, I'm very proud of things that I've been able to do. Um, and, I, and I like to take time to appreciate those things. You know, I, I wanted to win an Academy Award since I was a kid, right? And so I never want to discredit you know, any victories that you have along the way. But, you know, life, you, you, there's always, every day I wake up, there's something else that I want to do. And there's something else that I want to accomplish. And there's something else, somebody else I look at and I'm like, oh my God, that's a great idea. I can't believe I didn't think of that. And now, I, you know, I, I'm challenged in so many different ways uh, to do more. Um, and so I, I think it's, you know, the balance uh, of my, my favorite book, The Alchemist, of, um, of, of walking around and, and holding your oil in the spoon, uh, looking at the world around you, but not losing sight of what's right in front of you. Um, and so I, I don't like using the word I, I made it. 
Um, but I, I'm very, uh, I'm very blessed and I'm very appreciative of all that I've done. And I'm just, I'm, I wake up every day very excited uh, about the opportunities that I have to do more and about the opportunities that I have to use what I've done to do bigger things. Yeah. Well, it kind of goes what you were saying, right? Keep dreaming, keep going. I, yeah. I think that's what everybody needs to do. There's no, you don't get a certain age or to a certain point, especially if you look at the people that we all admire. I mean, some of those that you brought up, you know, they keep evolving and keep changing and things like that. So um, you brought up a book that you said one of your favorites. We are big readers here at Zoom. Do you have a couple, two or three other books that you'd like to recommend um, that you've either read recently or just some other favorites that you have? Yeah, um, I, I mentioned The Alchemist. Obviously, it should be on everybody's reading list. It's kind of a, fun, uh, a, a fundamental book almost at this point. Um, and all of like the, you know, the Four Agreements, um, Outliers, uh, you know, the 10,000 hours you got to put in and, you know, all of those books are, are, are mandatory reading. Um, I read a book that I really loved uh, recently called Who Ate the First Oyster? <clears throat> I love history. And it does this, uh, this deep dive analysis of all of the firsts in human history uh, that have contributed to where we are now. So like where the first fire was started, where who invented the first wheel, who invented the, the you know, the, the first sling to hold the baby and how all of those things affect us now. Um, and, and, and to your point of reading, I just think reading and, and just putting fuel into your gas tank is so important. Every time I read a book, I, I have new things to talk about. I have new things to think about. Um, and, and I just always promote, you know, reading, always keep a book on deck and always make sure you're, you're, you're putting some new gas into the tank. So if you were to write a book about your life, your memoir, what would be the title? Um, Ooh, that was good. <laughs> Zoom soul. How I, how I spend my way into your hearts without compromising my soul. Okay. Um, Nicole, really quick. This is a really good question I, I saw in chat. Um, it says, Terrence, has there been a situation uh, where you worked in production and they asked you to do something or say something that was against the culture? How did you handle it? Um, and did you go into an HBCU inform your response? Oh, absolutely. Um, and unfortunately, it, it happens more time uh, than, than I'd like. And the asterisk would be a lot of times it's, it's, it's they're unaware, right? And sometimes it be your own people. It's, you know, when you're reading scripts and when you're doing things, especially with, you know, I, I was doing a show called Safe Word. And on that particular show, you know, it was all about how we can, you know, uh, make people cringe or uncomfortable. And sometimes the writers would, you know, it would be things in there. And I'd be like, all right, well, we, we can't say that and here's why. This is gonna affect people in a way and, and here's why. And again, we, we now live in a very uh, culturally sensitive world. We now, you know, representation matters and um, understanding as much as you can about everybody matters. Um, I've had diversity training. Uh, I, I've uh, had training, you know, with, for LGBTQ. Um, I've had just, a, a, you know, Me Too training, just all the, the different understandings because we all want to make sure we can operate and communicate in a way that makes everybody around us comfortable. And so my job, especially as a producer, is to identify those things as much as I can. It's always, a, you know, a work in progress. We're always learning. We're always growing. But, you know, going to an HBCU and having that background and having four years of, of having it drilled into you what different things mean and what the, the nuances behind them mean and, you know, why things are the way they are uh, has helped me tremendously, right? So that if, if, if somebody wants to do a sketch and do blackface, not only am I going to be able to explain, hey, look, we're not doing that, right? And here's why. And here's what it meant. And here's where it began. And here's how it affected us, right? And, and so the more you're, you read and the more you have that, that understanding and that knowledge, 
the more you don't look at it from a, a, an aspect of, oh, you know, I want to tear down anybody that that presents something that might be culturally insensitive. It's how can I educate you uh, so that, you know, you now can leave the conversation, not from a combative standpoint, but how can we learn and grow, you know, right? And, and how can I educate you in any way that I can based off of the experiences and the knowledge that I have so that you can go out into the world and say, oh, well, this is what I've learned and this is how we can all be better uh, as a society, right? Because look, we're all humans. We're all working, we're all learning. We all wanna be the best versions of ourselves that we can be. And that can't be accomplished unless we educate and teach each other and we do it with love and compassion and, uh, and, and respect and patience. Terrence, are you working on any projects right now that you can share with us that we can look out for? Yeah, um, I have a Christmas movie uh, with Jamie Foxx uh, um, coming out November 30th. Um, uh, Mio's in the movie and Soraya and Kerry Olsen. Uh, and um, I'm really excited about it. It's coming out on Paramount. Um, so that comes out November 30th. Um, and then I have a horror movie uh, coming out at the top of the year. <clears throat> Um, which is going to be a, a, a really scary thrill ride. Uh, Joseph Shakur, who plays Tell Me on Power, um, is in it, and me and T.I. and uh, Deion Taylor directed it. It's super scary. Um, so those are my two next back-to-back -back films. Um, and then, like I said, I'll be making an announcement. I'm directing my next film, um, uh, hopefully by the, the end of this year. Um, so I'm, I'm very you know, busy and working and excited. Um, and I uh, can't wait for you guys to see my upcoming projects. Nice. And I was telling Maja a couple weeks ago, just, you know, casually watching TV and I saw you pop up in that car commercial and I, was, I had to do a double take. I was like, is it? I mean, it was just so like, I mean, you were just in it and it was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it was great seeing you in that too. But yeah, you know, it, again, man, it, it, uh, it, it, you know, thank you for watching. Um, but those opportunities happen because of people in the room like yourself, you know, the, you know, to, I, I'm, I'm currently doing a national, I don't, can you mention the car? I don't know if I don't want to mention it. Yeah, you can, you can mention yeah, it. But, you know, a national Chevy campaign airing during, you know, the football season and airing, you know, an international level uh, with a, a, a black HBCU voiceover, you know, hitting everyday Americas, right? And, and, you know, so it's a huge campaign, right? That happens because of people in the room such as yourself. That happens because there's representation in Detroit at that GM room that's like, okay, no, we need this person because they, they touch this person and it resonates like this. And that person had to fight for a budget. That person had to have a dream and fight for a campaign so that you're able to see it and then you're able to connect the dots. And then me being on that commercial is going to, you know, inspire a future creative that we don't even know that's going to take the things that we're doing to the next level, right? And that that commercial is also uh, about electric cars, and we need more. You know, I want to save the world. You know, I want to. You know, we need to have. Uh, uh, you, you know more hybrid cars and more, because we can't keep using gas and we can't keep destroying our planet, right? So all of that messaging, I'm just bringing it all back on why all of this is important, right? Me going to an HBCU 20 years ago was important for me to get that now. It's important for you to see that now. It's important for you guys to have these conversations now. It's important for this to be successful now so that they can give you more resources so that you can do more good work and we can influence and inspire more of us and, and we can continue to prosper and, and grow uh, as, a, as, as, a, as a people. I have a, a quick question. Um, and Terrence, when, you, when your movie comes out, tell them to let the Black people live in the horror movie, okay? <laughs> tell them that the girl from Zoom like Soul. <laughs> Spoiler alert, let the black things people don't live. go well, all right? <laughs> It's how black people love a Christmas movie. Every like it's like three or four, five, six, seven, eight coming out. No, but do you do you feel that there is sort of an HBCU community in the entertainment industry? Like, do you feel like you guys kind of stick together? Or? You know, I, the, the the problem it, there's more of us, right? 
you know, Meg the Stallion went to an HBCU. I mean, you're getting more and more. Um, but for, for me, Lance Gross, Keisha Knight pulling, like, I mean, for a good 10, 15 year stretch, it was just a few of us that for every HBCU panel, we were just out here fighting a good fight. You know, there wasn't many of us for years. Um, and so now, every time I see Coach Prime, every time I see, you know, the, the family growing and the HBCU, you know, fabric growing, I'm like, yes, please, finally, let's, let's go, let's get more. Um, and so to answer your question, there's not, not many of us, I can't name more than 10 to 15, and that's a problem. Uh, but it's, I, I, I am optimistic. Uh, that things are going in the right direction and this next generation is coming for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's good. All right, we got about five more minutes, four more minutes. Does anybody have any more questions for Terrence J? Y'all getting some good questions. Yeah, Terrence, we got a comment. Uh, I loved AJ and Free, but you did your thing. And I loved you on the oh, Power After you. Show, so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, tell 50, they need to bring that back. 50 and Courtney, tell them they need to bring the power show back. The, the, the power show. Yeah, you the know power what? after the show. show. <laughs> yeah, the other power show, we have to bring that back. There's so many powers now. We have to, uh, it is. Yeah. But the best ones with Tommy. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> <laughs> the first one, the original one. Okay, we got a question. Uh, who was your favorite? Oh, this is a good one. Who was your favorite person to interview while you were on 106? And why was it Beyonce? <laughs> um, you know, now nah, Beyonce was always fun. Rihanna was always fun. Uh, but you know, I love challenging interviews. You know, Kanye was always, you never knew which version of him you were going to get. You know, Eminem was a challenging interview. You know, you don't, DMX was challenging. I remember, you know, uh, Kobe Bryant was a great interview. You know, I, I look back at those years fondly. I don't think when I was doing it, I had a full understanding of like what the show would mean to the culture and what it meant. Um, but now, you know, looking back, a very fond experience uh, and, and just so many great interviews over the year. Yeah, yeah. Nicole, anything else from you? Otherwise we'll close this thing no, out. No, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for just, you know, sharing and, and preaching and uh, sharing, you know, letting us know all that you're doing. And we hope to have you back. So hope that, hopefully this is not a one and done. Um, this is our first ever HBCU week, but again, we hope to be even bigger and, and, and better as we go on over the years. But just thank you so much and continue, you know, with all the good work that you're doing. And we just really appreciate you so much. Throwing that right back at you. You are, you guys are doing phenomenal work. You know, Zoom is 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 one of those those companies and brands that have now, you know, come into all of our lives. Uh, you know, over the past couple of years, it's something you know we use on a daily, weekly basis. Um, and so it's great to know that that you know HBCU Zoom HBCU week is happening, and I can't wait for next year. And uh, hopefully, we can do some stuff in between as well. So I look forward to work with you guys. Yeah, and I echo everything um, Nicole said, Terrence. Thank you for, for joining us. Zoomies, thank you for um, joining us. Tell Fred, I know I'm, I've am i annoyed him, but that's okay. I'm going to continue to annoy him. <laughs> continue to work together. He was extremely, extremely helpful throughout this process. And yeah, we, we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. And again, we, we thank you so much. We appreciate you for spending your time with us. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Take care. All right, thank Terrence. You. Thanks, Zoomies. Later, guys.